The Adam Primus, or Cadman, the Logos of the Jewish mystics, is the same as the Grecian Prometheus, who seeks to rival with the divine wisdom. He is also the Pymander of Hermes, or the power of the thought divine, in its most spiritual aspect, for he was less hypostatized by the Egyptians than the two former. These all create men, but fail in their final object, desiring to endow man with an immortal spirit in order that by linking the Trinity in one, he might gradually return to his primal spiritual state without losing his individuality. Prometheus fails in his attempt to steal the divine fire and is sentenced to expiate his crime on Mount Kazbek. Prometheus is also the Logos of the ancient Greeks, as well as Heracles. In the Codex Nazareus, we see Bahak Zebo deserting the heaven of his father, confessing that though he is the father of the genii, he is unable to construct creatures, for he is equally unacquainted with Orcus as with the consuming fire which is wanting in light. And Fetahil, one of the powers, sits in the mud matter and wonders why the living fire is so changed. And now comes a mystery, a exegesis, a secret which Rabbi Simeon imparted but to very few initiates. It was enacted once every seven years during the mysteries of Samothrace, and the records of it are found self-printed on the leaves of the Tibetan sacred tree, the mysterious Kumbum in the Lamasari of the Holy Depths. In the shoreless ocean of space radiates the central, spiritual, and invisible sun. The universe is his body, spirit, and soul, and after this ideal model are framed all things. These three emanations are the three lives, three degrees of Gnostic pleroma, the three Kabbalistic faces. For the ancient of the ancient, the holy of the aged, the great and soul, has a form and then he has no form. The invisible assumed a form when he called the universe into existence, says the Zohar, the Book of Splendor. The first light is his soul, the infinite, boundless, and immortal breath, under the efflux of which the universe heaves its mighty bosom, infusing intelligent life throughout creation. The second emanation condenses cometary matter and produces forms within the cosmic circle sets the countless worlds floating in the electric space and infuses the unintelligent blind life principle into every form. The third produces the whole universe of physical matter and as it keeps gradually receding from the central divine light, its brightness wanes and it becomes darkness and the bad, pure matter, the gross purgations of the celestial fire of the hermeticists or hermetists. When the central invisible, the Lord Pharaoh, saw the efforts of the divine scintilla, unwilling to be dragged lower down into the degradation of matter to liberate itself, he permitted it to shoot out from itself a monad, over which, attached to it as by the finest thread, the divine scintilla, the soul, had to watch during its ceaseless peregrinations from one form to another. Then the monad was shot down into the first form of matter and became encased in stone. Then in course of time, through the combined efforts of living fire and living water, both of which shone their reflection upon the stone, the monad crept out of its prison to sunlight as a lichen. From change to change it went higher and higher, the monad with every new transformation borrowing more the radiance of its parent, scintilla, which approached it nearer at every transmigration. For the first cause had willed it to proceed in this order and destined it to creep on higher until its physical form became once more the atom of dust, shaped in the image of the atom Cadman, before undergoing its last earthly transformation. The external covering of the monad from the moment of its conception as an embryo passes in turn once more through the phases of the several kingdoms. In its fluidic prison, it assumes a vague resemblance at various periods of the gestation to plant, reptile, bird, and animal until it becomes a human embryo. At the birth of a future man, the monad, radiating with all the glory of its immortal parent, with which 
watches it from the seventh sphere becomes senseless. It loses all recollection of the past and returns to consciousness but gradually, when the instinct of childhood gives way to reason and intelligence. After the separation between the life principle or astral spirit and the body takes place, the liberated soul, monad, exultingly rejoins the mother and father spirit, the radiant Aguides, and the two merged into one forever form with a glory proportioned to the spiritual purity of the past earth life, the Adam, who has completed the circle of necessity and is freed from the last vestige of his physical encasement. Henceforth, growing more and more radiant at each step of his upward progress, he mounts the shining path that ends at the point from which he started around the grand cycle. The whole Darwinian theory of natural selection is included in the first six chapters of the book of Genesis. The man of chapter one is radically different from the Adam of chapter two, for the former was created male and female, that is, bisexed and in the image of God, while the latter, according to verse seven, was formed of the dust of the ground and became a living soul after the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Moreover. This Adam was a male being, and in verse 20 we are told that there was not found a helpmeet for him. The Adonai, being pure spiritual entities, had no sex, or rather had both sexes united in themselves, like their creator, and the ancients understood this so well that they represented many of their deities as a dual sex. The biblical student must either accept this interpretation or make the passages in the two chapters alluded to absurdly contradict each other. It was such literal acceptance of passages that warranted the atheists in covering the Mosaic account with ridicule. And it is the dead letter of the old text that begets the materialism of our age. Not only are these two races of beings thus clearly indicated in Genesis, but even a third and a fourth one are ushered before the reader in chapter 4, where the sons of God and the race of giants are spoken of. The great sages of antiquity those of the medieval ages and the mystical writers of our more modern times also were all hermitists. Whether the light of truth had illuminated them through their faculty of intuition or as a consequence of studying regular initiation virtually, they had accepted the method and followed the path traced to them by such men as Moses, Gautama Buddha, and Jesus. The truth, symbolized by some alchemists as dew from heaven, had descended into their hearts, and they had all gathered it upon the tops of mountains, after having spread clean linen cloths to receive it. And thus, in one sense, they had secured, each for himself and in his own way, the universal solvent. How much they were allowed to share with the public is another question. The everlasting conflict between the world religions, Christianity, Judaism, Brahmanism, Paganism, Buddhism, proceeds from this one source. Truth is known but to the few. The rest, unwilling to withdraw the veil from their own hearts, imagine it blinding the eyes of their neighbor. The God of every exoteric religion, including Christianity, notwithstanding its pretensions to mystery, is an idol, a fiction, and cannot be anything else. Where, then, lies the true, real secret, so much talked about by the Hermetists? That there was and that there is a secret no candid student of esoteric literature will ever doubt. Men of genius, says many of the Hermetic philosophers undeniably were, would not have made fools of themselves by trying to fool others for several thousand consecutive years. That this great secret, commonly termed the Philosopher's Stone, had a spiritual as well as physical meaning attached to it was suspected in all ages. The author of Remarks on Alchemy and the Alchemists very truly observes that the subject of the Hermetic art is man, and the object of the art is the perfection of man, but we cannot agree with him that only those whom he terms money-loving sots ever attempted to carry a purely moral design of the alchemists in the field of physical science. The fact alone that man in their eyes is a trinity which they divide into soul, that's S-O-L, soul, water of mercury and sulfur which is the secret fire or to speak plain into body, soul, and spirit, 
shows that there is a physical side to the question. Man is the philosopher's stone spiritually, a triune or trinity in unity, as Philalethes expresses it, as Philalethes expresses it. But he is also that stone physically. The latter is but the effect of the cause, and the cause is the universal solvent of everything, divine spirit. Man is a correlation of chemical physical forces, as well as a correlation of spiritual powers. The latter react on the physical powers of man in proportion to the development of the earthly man. The work is carried to perfection according to the virtue of a body, soul, and spirit, says an alchemist. For the body would never be penetrable were it not for the spirit, nor would the spirit be permanent in its super-perfect tincture were it not for the body. Nor could these two act upon one another without the soul, for the spirit is an invisible thing, nor doth it ever appear without another garment, which garment is the soul, that's S-O-U-L. The philosophers by fire asserted, through their chief, Robert Flood, that sympathy is the offspring of light, and antipathy hath its beginning from darkness. Moreover, they taught with other Kabbalists that contrarieties in nature doth proceed from one eternal essence, or from the root of all things. <clears throat> Thus, the first cause is the parent source of good as well as of evil. The Creator, who is not the highest God, is the father of matter, which is bad, as well as of the spirit, which emanating from the highest invisible cause, passes through him like through a vehicle and pervades the whole universe. It is most certain, remarks Robertus de Fluctibus, Robert Flood, that as there are an infinity of visible creatures, so there is an endless variety of invisible ones, of diverse natures, and in the universal machine. Through the mysterious name of God, which Moses was so desirous of him, Jehovah, to hear and know, when he received from him this answer, Jehovah is my everlasting name. As for the other name, it is so pure and simple that it cannot be articulated, or compounded, or truly expressed by man's voice. All the other names are wholly comprehended within it, for it contains the property as well of nullity as volunty, as of privation as position, of death as life, of curse as blessing, of evil as good, though nothing ideally is bad in him of hatred and discord, and consequently, of sympathy and antipathy. If modern science teaches that human thought affects the matter of another universe simultaneously with this, how can he who believes in intelligent first cause deny that the divine thought is equally transmitted by the same law of energy to our common mediator, or the universal ether, the world soul? And if so, then it must follow that once there the divine thought manifests itself objectively, energy faithfully reproducing the outlines of that whose probation was first born in the divine mind. Eliphas Levy expounds with reasonable clearness in the Dogme et Rituel de la Haute Magie the law of reciprocal influences between the planets and their combined effect upon the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms, as well as upon ourselves. He states that the astral atmosphere is as constantly changing from day to day, from hour to hour, as the air we breathe. He quotes approvingly the doctrine of Paracelsus, that every man, animal, and plant bears external and internal evidences of the influences dominant at the moment of germinal development. He repeats the old Kabbalistic doctrine that nothing is unimportant in nature, and that even so small a thing as the birth of one child upon our insignificant planet has its effect upon the universe, as the whole universe has its own reactive influence upon him. The stars, he remarks, are linked to each other by attractions which hold them in equilibrium and cause them to move with regularity through space. This network of light stretches from all the spheres to all the spheres, and there is not a point upon any planet to which is not attached one of these indestructible threads. The precise locality, as well as the hour of birth, should then be calculated by the true adept in astrology. 
Then, when he shall have made the exact calculation of the astral influences, it remains for him to count the chances of his position in life, the helps or hindrances he is likely to encounter, and his natural impulses toward the accomplishment of his destiny. He also asserts that the individual force of the person as indicating his ability to conquer difficulties and subdue unfavorable propensities and so carve out his fortune, or to passively await what blind fate may bring, must be taken into account. Man and soul had to conquer their immortality by ascending toward the unity with which, if successful, they were finally linked and into which they were absorbed, so to say. The individualization of man after death depended on the spirit, not on his soul and body. Although the word personality, in the sense in which it is usually understood, is an absurdity if applied literally to our immortal essence, still the latter is a distinct entity, immortal and eternal per se, and as in the case of criminals, beyond redemption. When the shining thread which links the spirit to the soul from the moment of the birth of a child is violently snapped, and the disembodied entity is led to share the fate of the lower animals, to gradually dissolve into ether and have its individuality annihilated, even then the spirit remains a distinct being. It becomes a planetary spirit, an angel, for the gods of the pagan or the archangels of the Christian the direct emanations of the first cause, notwithstanding the hazardous statement of Swedenborg, never were or will be men on our planet, at least. This specialization has been in all ages the stumbling block of metaphysicians. The whole esotericism of the Buddhistical philosophy is based on this mysterious teaching understood by so few persons and so totally misrepresented by many of the most learned scholars. Even metaphysicians are too inclined to confound the effect of the cause. A person may have won his immortal life and remain the same inner self he was on earth throughout eternity, but this does not imply necessarily that he must either remain the Mr. Smith or Brown he was on earth or lose his individuality. Therefore, the astral soul and terrestrial body of man may, in the dark hereafter, be absorbed into the cosmical ocean of sublimated elements and cease to feel his ego, if this ego did not deserve to soar higher, and the divine spirit still remain an unchanged entity, though this terrestrial experience of his emanations may be totally obliterated at the instant of separation from the unworthy vehicle. Pythagoras taught that the entire universe is one vast system of mathematically correct combinations. Plato shows the deity geometrizing. The world is sustained by the same law of equilibrium and harmony upon which it was built. The centripetal force could not manifest itself without the centrifugal and the harmonious revolutions of the spheres. All forms are the product of this dual force in nature. Thus, to illustrate our case, we may designate the spirit as the centrifugal and the soul as the centripetal, spiritual energies. When in perfect harmony, both forces produce one result, break or damage the centripetal motion of the earthly soul, tending toward the center which attracts it, arrest its progress by clogging it with a heavier weight of matter than it can bear, and the harmony of the whole, which was its life, is destroyed. Individual life can only be continued if sustained by this twofold force. The least deviation from harmony damages it. When it is destroyed beyond redemption, the forces separate and the form is gradually annihilated. After the death of the depraved and the wicked arrives the critical moment. If during life the ultimate and desperate effort of the inner self to reunite itself with the faintly glimmering ray of its divine parent is neglected, if this ray is allowed to be more and more shut out by the thickening crust of matter, the soul, once freed from the body, follows its earthly attractions and is magnetically drawn into and held within the dense fogs of the material atmosphere. Then it begins to sink lower and lower until it finds itself when returned to consciousness in what the ancients termed Hades. The annihilation of such a soul is never instantaneous. It may last centuries, perhaps, for nature never proceeds by jumps and starts and the astral soul being formed of elements, the law of evolution must bide its time. Then begins the fearful law of compensation. 
the yin yang of the Buddhists. Once past the threshold of the sanctuary of initiation, once then the adept has lifted the veil of Isis, the mysterious and jealous goddess, he has nothing to fear, but till then, he is in constant danger. The phenomenon is as old as the world. The priests of India and China practiced it before the Egyptians and the Greeks. The savages and the Eskimo know it well. It is the phenomenon of faith, sole source of every prodigy, and it will be done to you according to your faith. The one who enunciated this profound doctrine was verily the incarnated word of truth. He neither deceived himself nor wanted to deceive others. He expounded an axiom which we now repeat without much hope of seeing it accepted. Man is a microcosm or a little world. He carries in him a fragment of the great all in a chaotic state. The task of our half-gods is to disentangle from it the share belonging to them by an incessant mental and material labor. They have their task to do, the perpetual invention of new products, of new moralities, and the proper arrangement of the crude and formless material furnished them by the Creator, who created them in his own image, and that they should create in their turn and so complete here the work of the creation. An immense labor which can be achieved only when the whole will become so perfect that it will be like unto God himself and thus able to survive to itself. We are very far yet from that final moment, for we can say that everything is to be done, to be undone and outdone as yet on our globe. Institutions, machinery, and products. We live in this life in an ambient intellectual center which entertains between human beings and things a necessary and perpetual solidarity. Every brain is a ganglion and a station of a universal neurological telegraphy in constant rapport with the central and other stations by the vibrations of thought. The spiritual sun shines for souls as the material sun shines for bodies, for the universe is double and follows the law of couples. The ignorant operator interprets erroneously the divine dispatches and often delivers them in a false and ridiculous manner. Thus, steady and true science alone can destroy the superstitions and nonsense spread by the ignorant interpreters placed at the stations of teaching among every people in this world. These blind interpreters of the verbum, the word, have always tried to impose on their pupils the obligation to swear on everything without examination in verba magistry. Alas, we could wish for nothing better were they to translate correctly the air voices, which voices never deceive but those who have false spirits in them. It is our duty, they say, to interpret oracles. It is we who have received the exclusive mission for it from heaven. Spiritus flat ubi vult, and it blows on us alone. It blows on everyone, and the rays of the spiritual light illuminate every conscience. And when all the bodies and all the minds will reflect equally this dual light, people will see a great deal clearer than they do now. We have translated and quoted the above fragment for their ori great originality and truthfulness. We know the writer, fame proclaims him, a great capitalist, and a few friends know him as a truthful and honest man. The astral spirit is a faithful duplicate of the body, both in a physical and spiritual sense. The secret doctrine teaches that man, if he wins immortality, will remain forever the trinity that he is in life, and will continue so throughout all the spheres. The astral body, which in this life is covered by a gross physical envelope, becomes, when relieved of that covering by the process of corporeal death, in its turn the shell of another and more ethereal body. This begins developing from the moment of death and becomes perfected when the astral body of the earthly form finally separates from it. This process, they say, is repeated at every new transition from sphere to sphere. But the immortal soul, the silvery spark observed by Dr. Fenwick in Margrave's brain and not found by him in the animals, never changes but remains indestructible by aught that shatters its tabernacle. The harmony which geometry and mathematics, the only exact sciences, demonstrate to be the law of the universe, would be destroyed if evolution were perfectly exemplified in man alone and limited in the subordinate kingdoms. What logic suggests, psychometry proves. 
For who is able to controvert the theory previously suggested that the Earth itself will, like the living creatures to which it has given birth, ultimately, and after passing through its own stage of death and dissolution, become an etherealized astral planet? As above, so below. Harmony is the great law of nature. If the spiritualists have their phenomena under test conditions, so had the old theurgists, whose records, moreover, show that they could produce and vary them at will. The day when this fact shall be recognized and profitless speculations of modern investigators shall give place to patient study of the works of the theurgists will mark the dawn of new and important discoveries in the field of psychology. The universe is there, and we know that we exist, but how did it come and how did we appear in it? Denied an answer by the representatives of physical learning and excommunicated and anathematized for a blasphemous curiosity by the spiritual usurpers, what can we do but turn for information to the sages who meditated upon the subject ages before the molecules of our philosophers aggregated it in ethereal space? Denied an answer by the representatives of physical learning and excommunicated and anathematized for a blasphemous curiosity by the spiritual usurpers, what can we do but turn for information to the sages who meditated upon the subject ages before the molecules of our philosophers aggregated in ethereal space? Porphyry presents to us some hideous facts, whose verity is substantiated in the experience of every student of magic. The soul, says he, having even after death a certain affection for its body, an affinity proportioned to the violence with which their union was broken, we see many spirits hovering in despair about their earthly remains. We even see them eagerly seeking the putrid remains of other bodies, but above all freshly spilled blood, which seems to impart to them for the moment some of the faculties of life. Origen held all the demons which possessed the demoniacs mentioned in the New Testament to be human spirits. It is because Moses knew so well what they were and how terrible were the consequences to weak persons who yielded to their influence that he enacted the cruel murderous law against such would-be witches. But Jesus, full of justice and divine love to humanity, healed instead of killing them. Subsequently, our clergy, the pretended exemplars of Christian principles, followed the law of Moses and quietly ignored the law of him whom they call their one living God, by burning dozens of thousands of such pretended witches. The words witch and wizard, according to Dr. Moore, signify no more than a wise man or a wise woman. In the word wizard, it is plain at the very sight and the most plain and least operous deduction of the name witch is from wit, whose derived adjective might be wittig or wittich, and by contraction afterwards, witch, as the noun wit is from the verb to wheat, which is to know, so that a witch thus far is no more than a knowing woman, which answers exactly to the Latin word saga. According to that of Festus, Sage dicte anus qua multa silent. This definition of the word appears to us the more plausible as it exactly answers the evident meaning of the Slavonian Russian names for witches and wizards. The former is called Viedma, the latter Viedmak, both from the verb to know, Vedat or Viedat, the root, moreover, being positively Sanskrit. Veda, says Max Muller in his lecture on the Vedas, means originally knowing or knowledge. Veda is the same word which appears in Greek. I know that de gamma, thou being omitted, and in the English wise, wisdom to wit. Furthermore, the Sanskrit word vidma, answering to the German vir wissen, means literally, we know. It is a great pity that the eminent philologist, while giving in his lecture the Sanskrit, Greek, Gothic, Anglo-Saxon, and German comparative roots of this word, has neglected the Slavonian. Another Russian appellation for witch and wizard, the former being purely Slavonian, is znahar and znaharka, feminine, from the same verb znat to know. Thus, Dr. Moore's definition of the word given in 1678 is perfectly correct and coincides in every particular with modern philology. 
These demons seek to introduce themselves into the bodies of the simple-minded and idiots and remain there until dislodged therefrom by a powerful and pure will. Jesus, Apollonius, and some of the apostles had the power to cast out devils by purifying the atmosphere within and without the patients so as to force the unwelcome tenant to flight. Certain volatile salts are particularly obnoxious to them and the effect of the chemicals used in a saucer and placed under the bed by Mr. Varley of London for the purpose of keeping away some disagreeable physical phenomena at night are corroborative of this great truth. Pure or even simply inoffensive human spirits fear nothing for having rid themselves of terrestrial matter. Terrestrial compounds can affect them in no wise. Such spirits are like a breath, not so with the earthbound souls and the nature spirits. Observation, and what would now be termed remarkable coincidences, added to revelation during the sacred sleep of the neophyte, disclosed the dreadful truth. So horrible is the thought that even those who ought to be convinced of it prefer ignoring it, or at least avoid speaking on the subject. This way of obtaining oracles was practiced in the highest antiquity. In India, this sublime lethargy is called the sacred sleep of. It is an oblivion into which the subject is thrown by certain magical processes, supplemented by droughts of the juice of the soma. The body of the sleeper remains for several days in a condition resembling death, and by the power of the adept is purified of its earthliness and made fit to become the temporary receptacle of the brightness of the immortal Aguides. In this state, the torpid body is made to reflect the glory of the upper spheres, as a burnished mirror does the rays of the sun. The sleeper takes no note of the lapse of time, but upon awakening, after four or five days of trance, imagines he has slept but a few moments. What his lips utter, he will never know. But as it is the spirit which directs them, he can produce nothing but divine truth. For the time being, the poor helpless clod has made the shrine of the sacred presence and converted into an oracle a thousand times more infallible than the asphyxiated pythoness of Delphi. And unlike her mantic frenzy, which was exhibited before the multitude, this holy sleep is witnessed only within the sacred precinct by those few of the adepts who are worthy to stand in the presence of the Adonai. If the universality of a belief be a proof of its truth, few facts have been better established than that of sorcery. From whatever aspect we view and question matter, the world-old philosophy that it was vivified and fructified by the eternal idea or imagination the abstract outlining and preparing the model for the concrete form is unavoidable. If we reject this doctrine, the theory of a cosmos evolving gradually out of its chaotic disorder becomes an absurdity, for it is highly unphilosophical to imagine inert matter, solely moved by blind force and directed by intelligence, forming itself spontaneously into a universe of such admirable harmony. If the soul of man is really an outcome of the essence of this universal soul, an infinitesimal fragment of this first creative principle. It must, of necessity, partake in degree of all the attributes of the demiurgic power. As the creator, breaking up the chaotic mass of dead, inactive matter, shaped it into form, so man, if he knew his powers, could, to a degree, do the same. As Phaedius, gathering together the loose particles of clay and moistening them with water, could give plastic shape to the sublime idea evoked by his creative faculty, so the mother who knows her power can fashion the coming child into whatever form she likes. Ignorant of his powers, the sculptor produces only an inanimate, though ravishing figure of inert matter, while the soul of the mother, violently affected by her imagination, blindly projects into the astral light an image of the object which impressed it, and by repercussion, that is stamped upon the fetus. Science tells us that the law of gravitation assures us that any displacement which takes place in the very heart of the earth will be felt throughout the universe. And we may even imagine that the same thing will hold true, those molecular motions which accompany thought. Speaking of the transmission of energy throughout the universal ether or astral light, the same authority says, continual photographs of all occurrences are thus produced and retained. A large portion of the energy of the universe may thus be said to be invested in such pictures. And here we may as well mention the works of Hermes Trismegistus, who or how many have had the opportunity to read them as they were in the Egyptian sanctuaries. 
In his Egyptian mysteries, Iamblichus attributes to Hermes 1,100 books, and Seleucus reckons no less than 20,000 of his works before the period of Menes. Eusebius saw but 42 of these in his time, he says, and the last of the six books on medicine treated on that art as practiced in the darkest ages, and Diodorus says that it was the oldest of the legislators, Menevis, the third successor of Menes, who received them from Hermes. Of such manuscripts as have descended to us, most are but Latin retranslations of Greek translations, made principally by the Neoplatonists from the original books preserved by some adepts. If men of science would confine themselves to the discrediting of new discoveries, there might be some little excuse for them on the score of their tendency to a conservatism begotten of long habits of patient scrutiny. But they not only set up claims to originality not warranted by fact, but contemptuously dismiss all allegations that the people of ancient times knew as much and even more than themselves. Pity that in search of their laboratories there was not suspended this text from Ecclesiastes. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. Herodotus was regarded as a lunatic for speaking of a people who he was told slept during a night which lasted six months. If we explain the word slept by an easy misunderstanding, it will be more than easy to account for the rest as an allusion to the night of the polar regions. The unanimous testimony of mankind is said to be an irrefutable proof of truth. And about what was ever testimony more unanimous than that for thousands of ages among civilized people as among the most barbarous, there has existed a firm and unwavering belief in magic. The latter implies a contravention of the laws of nature only in the minds of the ignorant, and if such ignorance is to be deplored in an ancient uneducated nations, why do not our civilized and highly educated classes of fervent Christians deplore it also in themselves? The mysteries of the Christian religion have been no more able to stand a crucial test than biblical miracles. Magic alone, in the true sense of the word, affords a clue to the wonders of Aaron's rod and the feats of the magi of Pharaoh, who opposed Moses. And it does that without either impairing the general truthfulness of the authors of the Exodus, or claiming more for the prophet of Israel than for others, or allowing the possibility of a single instance in which a miracle can happen in contravention of the laws of nature. Out of many miracles, we may select for our illustration that of the river turned into blood. The text says, Take thy rod and stretch out thine hand, with the rod in it, upon the water, streams, etc., that they may become blood. The rod plays as important a part in the hands of Aaron and Moses as it did in all so-called magic mummeries of Kabbalist magicians in the Middle Ages that are now considered superstitious foolery and charlatanism. The rod of Paracelsus, his Kabbalistic trident, and the famous wands of Albertus Magnus, Roger Bacon, and Henry Kunra, are no more to be ridiculed than the graduating rod of our electromagnetic physicians, things which appear preposterous and impossible to the ignorant quacks, and even learned scientists of the last century now begin to assume the shadowy outlines of probability, and in many cases are accomplished facts. Nay, some learned quacks and ignorant scientists even begin to admit this truth. Let them push boldly on till they discover that it is not spirit that dwells in matter, but matter which clings temporarily to spirit, and that the latter alone is an eternal, imperishable abode for all things visible and invisible. This mystery of first creation, which was ever the despair of science, is unfathomable, unless we accept the doctrine of the Hermetists. The viability of the astral form is so feeble that the particles cannot cohere firmly when once it is slipped out of the unyielding capsule of the external body, its particles gradually obeying the disorganizing attraction of universal space, finally fly asunder beyond the possibility of reaggregation. Upon the occurrence of such a catastrophe, the individual ceases to exist. His glorious Aguides has left him during the intermediary period between his bodily death and the disintegration of the astral form. The latter, bound by magnetic attraction to its ghastly corpse, prowls about and sucks vitality from the susceptible victims. The man having shut out of himself every ray of the divine light is lost in darkness and therefore clings to the earth and the earthy. 
no astral soul, even that of a pure, good, and virtuous man, is immortal in the strictest sense. From elements it was formed, to elements it must return. Only while the soul of the wicked vanishes and is absorbed without redemption, that of every other person, even moderately pure, simply changes its ethereal particles for still more ethereal ones. And while there remains in it a spark of the divine, the individual man, or rather his personal ego, cannot die. After death, says Proclus, the soul, the spirit, continueth to linger in the aerial body, astral form, till it is entirely purified from all angry and voluptuous passions, then doth it put off by a second dying the aerial body as it did the earthly one. Whereupon the ancients say that there is a celestial body always joined with the soul, and which is immortal, luminous, and star-like. In the Jewish Kabbalah, the second and third chapters of Genesis are explained thus. When the second Adam is created out of the dust, matter has become so gross that it reigns supreme. Out of its lusts evolves woman, and Lilith has the best of spirit. Prayer opens the spiritual sight of man, for prayer is desire, and desire develops will. The magnetic emanations proceeding from the body at every effort, whether mental or physical, produce self-magnetization and ecstasy. Plotinus recommends solitude for prayer as the most efficient means of obtaining what is asked, and Plato advised those who pray to remain silent in the presence of the Divine Ones, till they remove the cloud from thy eyes, and enable thee to see by the light which issues from themselves. Apollonius always isolated himself from men during the conversation he held with God, and whenever he felt the necessity for divine contemplation and prayer, he wrapped himself, head and all, in the drapery of his white woolen mantle. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father in secret, says the Nazarene, the pupil of the Essenes. Every human being is born with the rudiment of the inner sense called intuition, which may be developed into what the Scotch know as second sight. All the great philosophers who, like Plotinus, Porphyry, and Iamblichus, employed this faculty, taught the doctrine. There is a faculty of the human mind, writes Iamblichus, which is superior to all which is born or begotten. Through it we are enabled to attain union with the superior intelligences, to being transported beyond the scenes of this world and to partaking the higher life and peculiar powers of the heavenly ones. Were there no inner sight or intuition, the Jews would never have had their Bible, nor the Christians, Jesus. What both Moses and Jesus gave to the world was the fruit of their intuition or illumination. What their subsequent elders and teachers allowed the world to understand was dogmatic misrepresentations, too often blasphemy. To accept the Bible as a revelation and nail belief to a literal translation is worse than absurdity. It is a blasphemy against the divine majesty of the unseen. If we had to judge of the deity and the world of spirits by its human interpreters, now that philology proceeds with giant strides on the fields of comparative religions, belief in God and the soul's immortality could not withstand the attacks of reason for one century more. That which supports the faith of man in God and a spiritual life to come is intuition that divine outcome of our inner self which defies the mummeries of the Roman Catholic priest and his ridiculous idols, the thousand and one ceremonies of the Brahmin and his idols, and the Jeremiads of the Protestant preacher, and his desolate and arid creed with no idols but a boundless hell and damnation hooked on at that end. Were it not for this intuition undying, though often wavering because so clogged with matter, human life would be a parody and humanity a fraud. This ineradicable feeling of the presence of someone outside and inside ourselves is one that no dogmatic contradictions, no external form of worship can destroy in humanity. Let scientists and clergy do what they may. Moved by such thoughts of the boundlessness and impersonality of the deity, Gautama Buddha, the Hindu Christ, exclaimed, as the four rivers which fall in the Ganges lose their names as soon as they mingle their waters with the holy river, so all who believe in Buddha cease to be Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaisyas, and Sudras. The Old Testament was compiled and arranged from oral tradition. The masses never knew its real meaning. For Moses was ordered to impart the hidden truths, but to his seventy elders on whom the Lord put of the spirit which was upon the legislator.